Welcome to another edition, no, not just another edition, episode 400 of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and today's June 1st, 2018. George, how are the daughters traveling the world? Oh, they're having fun. Claudia's just home. She just flew in from Perth, but we got a text from Laura. Help, I'm broke and I have diarrhea. <laughs> that sounds like you in Tanzania. <laughs> no, I had I had some I was sick for you, months afterwards. You were, it was I bad. just didn't have diarrhea. She my it's it's so funny. She this is the fourth or fifth week of her trek across Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia! I mean, I'm still thinking Pol Pot yeah, and the Kong and, and everything. Yeah. And she finally is spent spent the weekend at the tourist destination of Phuket, Phuket, off the uh, coast of Thailand. That's where you're gonna get sick. And that's where she got sick. Not in Chiang Mai, <laughs> not up country, uh, not along the border with Burma, but in the tourist traps. She gets diarrhea and spends all her money. Mm. So Daddy came to the rescue with uh, putting money in her. It's a wonderful world, Kevin. I remember in the days when I, you know, was in college and I needed money, and you had to go to, like to the Western Union office and you did. stuff. Yeah. You, you had to go, when I needed money in college, I actually had to go visit mom and dad and have dinner with them. Yeah. But, you know, in other words, just the ability to send money to sure. transfer. Mm -hmm. Here, I just put it in her Bank of America account, and she can go to an ATM machine in Phuket, Thailand, and take the cash out immediately. Yeah, in their denomination. It, in know, their it's, de it, it's just amazing, it's the it. things we can do these days. We oh, sound like old farts, don't we, Kevin? We, I, mean, I am so things old. Things I could do today. I mean, my <laughs> goodness. Jeez. <laughs> What are these it's dang crazy. cell phones? Yeah, I remember when I would not, I would refuse to have friends that had zero in their name because I'd always stutter at the rotary. Yep, no, I know. <laughs> All right, before you go any further, I need you to like this episode because things may change. I want you to, you can save your comments for after the episode. Subscribe to these episodes if you're not a subscriber yet. And lo and behold, share us. Before you watch the whole thing, please share us. Um, just letting you know. I'll, I need to read an email uh, from one of our viewers because uh, I put my foot in my mouth. <clears throat> if you guys remember, I kind of gave my testimony last time I was on with George. Episode 398 talked about uh, a probably the last conservative pastor in the United Church of Christ had brought me to Christ and... Um, we actually have lots of UCC pastors who uh, watch the program, and they they write once in a while, and I got in trouble. Kevin, comma, that's bad. That it's starting bad. I listened to your interview today with George. It's not an interview. This is host co-host, and your comment about the last pastor in the UCC who led you to Christ, and the statement that there were none left in the UCC who believed. I would like to correct that statement. There are those of us still in the UCC who remain Orthodox, Reformed, and Faithful. And he goes on and on and on. And I apologize. So uh, I'm not going to throw you guys under the bus. Uh, I sometimes make these very vast statements uh, about other denominations when, you know, Anglicanism is nothing to smile about nowadays, George. Kevin, you're the Donald Trump of Anglican unscripted. <laughs> Just foot and mouth. You know, I'm not going to demonstrate it, but, you know, sometimes I do that. You know, it's unscripted. I open my mouth because I, you know, I think I'm in a better place. You know, there's days that, you know, the Anglican Church, the Anglican Communion is just like uh, the UCC in its lackadaisicalness. Except, Kevin, whereas uh, the President of the United States gets to hang out with Kim Kardashian in his Oval Office, who would hang out with me. So <laughs> I think. <laughs> Did you see I the headline from the Daily Mail? Interesting. Trump meets Rump. <laughs> Oh, that was a headline in the New York Post. Oh, Post. My. oh, my Lord. Okay, so we actually have a lot of good news for episode 400. We're going to talk about other provinces and forming provinces. Back when I became an Anglican years ago, there were 38 provinces, maybe 39. Now we're hitting 41, 42, and that's good news because it's happening outside the Anglican 
uh, the official Anglican Petri dish. And I'm talking about uh, the Instruments of Unity, Lambeth, outside of Canterbury, outside the ACC. Um, there's, in the primates meeting, there are Anglican explosions happening in South America. And I think this is a great time for us to talk about. Now, Archbishop B slash Bishop Tito is a friend of mine. We get to talk whenever uh, we're at joint conferences together. And uh, he's pulling off some amazing stuff, George. Diocese of Chile has been growing very strongly over the past few years. And it has uh, petitioned and the province of South America under the, under the leadership of uh, uh, Greg Venables to become its own independent province. The, pro the uh, province has said yes, and the synod held their meeting and elected two new bishops to join the two existing bishops, Enrique Lago and uh, Samuel Morrison were elected to join Abelino Apolio and Tito Zavala. So Chile has four bishops, it's going to divide into four dioceses and become the 40th or 41st or 42nd Second. or 43rd <laughs> How you do province your math. <laughs> of the Anglican Communion, however you do your math. Well, you no, know, Kevin, it's interesting three of, the, three of these four guys all went to Trinity Seminary, so yeah. I think they should get a they should get a, a group discount next time they send somebody up there. <laughs> Chile is not like the other pro provinces in um, South America; they're a bit more European, George. Yeah, Chile, Uruguay, uh, Argentina uh, are not like most Americans' perception of. Latin America, which is basically driven by Central America. Mm -hmm. Chile is not Mexico. Chile is more of a European temperament. Very high proportion of nuns, religious non-believers amongst its population. Uh, it's a very cosmopolitan country. Yes, there's much poverty. Uh, yes, there's great extremes of wealth, but it's closer in uh, feel to Spain than it is to Mexico, by far. Wow. And what I think is so encouraging and exciting is that the Anglican way is ve is doing very well in this secularist, modernist, post-Christian culture. It's growing. Now, Chile, if you've been following the church news, has had a trouble. Its 34 bishops has, have tendered their resignation to Pope Francis over sexual abuse scandals and all this and that. Yet, the Anglican way focusing on the Bible, on prayer, on, you know, on the Book of Common Prayer, is working there. And as you said, it's not just a clone of the Church of England. It's its, its own indigenous national expression of Anglicanism. It's really exciting news. It is. And we just had news two weeks ago where we talked about um, Miguel and Anachoa and the uh, uh, kind of the province of Brazil. Yeah, I see that Miguel Ochoa is just the Bishop of Recife, they've just formed the Anglican Church of Brazil, based in Recife, but it's now it's spread across the, uh, the, the country and has outposts in other South American nations in that northern tier, Colombia and whatnot. And it is doing quite well, with no resources whatsoever coming out of the poorest part of Brazil. The Northeast is not... Uh, I've been to Recife, and I've been all the way down to South and Puerto Alegre, and and they're different countries. It, absolutely, and they're different worlds. Yet the Anglican way is doing very well. I actually believe that the Miguel Ochoa's province has more people than than the Anglican Episcopal Church of Brazil, yeah. the historic province. Yeah, uh, because their numbers have been squirrely for about twenty five years. You can't trust them. And if you and if you take out the money handed down from New York and London, and if you and if you exercise out the English chaplaincies in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, I don't think they're actually a functioning church, as far as I can tell. Probably not. Now, my question here is: I've I've felt some consternation from the head of the ACC and other uh, formularies over in the Church of England, who really. Are trying to stop what's getting what they think is getting out of hand, and so much so that Gafcon had to issue a statement that this is truly Anglican. Um, I think there's no way the Church of England, Canterbury, the ACC, or Lambeth, or the primates can stop this, George. 
Kevin, uh, what you're referring to is that Josiah Dawufaron, the Secretary General of the Anglican Consultative Council, put out a statement saying the Anglican Church of Brazil is not Anglican because it's not a member of the Anglican Consultative Council and it's not in communion with the Sea of Canterbury. Well, both of those things are true, but it begs the question, what is it to be an Anglican? Uh, there was no Anglican Consultative Council. When I was born, I was not baptized in a church that was part of the Anglican Consultative Council, the Episcopal Church of the USA, because the Ang Anglican Consultative Council didn't come out until the 70s. It's a recent innovation, and it is not the measure, and never has been the measure. It's a consultative council. It's not the council of the church. The Episcopal Church was not in communion with the Church of England for its first hundred years. Yet, it was recognized as being fully Anglican. It was not in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury. This whole Canterbury-centric focus only has come out within a very recent period of time um, and is the final little outworking of what's left of the British Empire. And basically, it's going to disappear soon. Yeah. For, for 20 years, I have been hearing at primates meetings, we have to change who is the premise into Paris, the first among equals. Because right now, the person who chooses the head of the Anglican Communion is the British Prime Minister. And that may have been acceptable a hundred years ago when Britain ran the empire, but it is far from acceptable today. And certainly with the British Church of England being such a weak position, um, it can't punch. It can't. It's. It can't punch. It's punching way below uh, its, weight, its ability yes. to fight. Yeah. Now, one of the interesting things, you know, credit to Justin Welby and Rowan Williams on this, they both concur that uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury's role, you know, communion wide, is should be the responsibility of two people, not one. Uh. Uh, we're going to now get into the weeds here. Uh -oh. There was because I don't trust that statement, and people will say I'm a cynic, but I've been around too long and I've been fooled too often. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury said he wants to have a wider role and bring in people from overseas to help select the next Archbishop of Canterbury. What that is, it's a way to ensure the power of the Archbishop of Canterbury by claiming that it has the sanction of the wider communion. What that means is they will bring it, just like they did last time, uh, they had Barry Morgan, the Archbishop of Wales, represent the wider Anglican communion in the selection process. Well, you know, that's the fix is in if you have Barry Morgan, who's as liberal as they come, mm -hmm. representing the wider Anglican communion. Um, what we're seeing... Uh, that call that the Archbishop of Canterbury made it has been received by the overseas primates, in my estimation, as being a feint to increase the power of the bureaucracy in London. It is not a genuine response to the changing world. Uh, just as the Catholic Church had to get over having only Italians as popes, so the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, at the Anglican Communion has to get over having only English upper-class qu twits. That's right. Uh, as uh, which wouldn't describe George Carey or Rowan Williams, but certainly describes Justin Welby uh, as archbishops. Let's move on to some local news. Well, it's right between the two of us. Diocese of Virginia. We heard from uh, Bishop Shannon Johnson through a letter he wrote that he's no longer looking for a suffragan bishop. And the first thing I thought, oh, they're broke, no money. But there's more rumors. There's actually layers upon layers upon layers going on here. Because you hinted to me that there's actually a restraining order from a, a, a gay couple uh, against their priest. The priest had issued a restraining order. I said, No, it's yeah. against the parishioners from the priest. Uh, and I'm like, Yeah, I said, we need to get to the bottom of this and finally break this news. Um, tell us about the diocese. Diocese of Virginia, Shannon Johnston, uh, is in his, er, he's 60, and he uh, 
put out a letter this past week saying we're not going to go through the suffragan process because I want to have at least five years in which I can train the suffragan and be with him, and I may not last that long in this job. Now, most bishops are elected when they're 60. They don't start talking about retiring when they're 60. And this letter came as a shock to a lot of people. So, so we started asking questions. And the first response was, I don't know, what do you know? But, but we kept going. And I've been in correspondence with a parishioner at Grace Church Alexandria, Virginia, who uh, has had a terrible fight with the rector there, such that the rector has issued a restraining order against him and his partner, preventing them from coming onto the church grounds. This escalated into a Title IV conflict, uh, ver uh, alleging sexual, sexual discrimination and bullying. And the response from the diocese was, well, f fix it yourself. We're not going to worry about this. And so that opened a door, and the door that's open leads me to these uh, anecdotal statements. Bishop Johnston, people tell me, has been more enthralled with being a bishop than actually doing the job of a bishop. Now, I have heard the same thing, that he's a bishop in purple only from people who wanted to correct me when we were talking about the Trill story uh, year, about a year ago. He said, you don't understand, Trill can walk all over Bishop Johnson because, well, he's just a guy in clothing. He doesn't really care about the mundane work of being a bishop. Bishop, the the rap, if you will, or the the uh, allegations are, and they're totally non-provable by me at this stage, mm -hmm. is that Bishop Johnston is not really concerned with issues of clergy discipline or with uh, parochial health. Uh, pay your money, and so that he can fund the lawsuits, and be bishop. He's not really involved, and. Well, we had an odd thing happen last month. The candidate of the ordinary, Pat Wingo, the Diocese of Virginia, resigned to take up a job as an interim rector in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is unusual. Highly and unusual. The, and in the exit interview, uh, we're told that it came out that uh, Canon Wingo described the culture of the diocesan office as being poisonous. Now, I wasn't there. I don't know if he used that word, but that's what's been repeated to me. Poisonous and it's about Bishop Jans the Bishop Johnston's management culture of being a little bit of a petty tyrant and and so that the staff at the diocesan office is very bloated. It's got a huge staff. It doesn't do very much. And if we sort of step back and look at this, it's a case of a resume being called being hired as bishop not a pastor. Mm -hmm. And so here you've got somebody who looks and fits and does the and looks good in the official portraits but doesn't actually do the work of building the church. So what we've got now is we have the gay lobby mad at Shannon Johnston. The conservatives have been mad at him for years. His own supporters uh, dislike him and the candidate of the ordinary whom he hired quits because he's a bad leader. So Folks, if you know more than I do, tell us. <laughs> yeah, send but your what we're email. hearing is that of a diocese in dysfunction at the very top, and its parishes not having adequate support or supervision. Hmm. All right. Now, now uh, evidently, this lawsuit uh, is going to be in the Alexandria Circuit Court in October, where the man, where the priest has to defend taking out a restraining order against parishioners. Well, in in his defense, I know lots of priests who had wished they could have taken out restraining orders, you know, of certain church organists, of certain choir leaders, you know, it, it, it's not the first time it's been thought of. True, but when a priest, when it gets to that point, that's when a bishop, a good bishop, that's intervenes bishop to sue for waters. Yeah. And especially when the people complaining are complaining about uh, some hanky-panky with the books and mm -hmm. stuff, you know. And sexual discrimination. And it, bishop Johnston didn't cause the parish problem, but a good bishop would have been on this a lot sooner. On scene, absolutely. Uh, let's move to Toronto real quick. Um, do you remember the, the bishop who, well, I don't know if she's a bishop, but uh, uh, she ran Christchurch over in um, 
New Zealand. New Zealand. Uh, she is up for bishopship in Toronto. Victoria Matthews started off as Suffragan Bishop of Toronto, then went out to Edmonton, then over to Christchurch, New Zealand, and she just resigned and has moved back to Canada and is now standing for election as Bishop of Toronto. Now, she was always sort of the darling of what I call the uh, wet conservatives, you know, the sort of soggy people uh, who, uh, who, you know, well, I won't well, go any further. Yeah, no, I would say the communion partner type people who said, you know, there's a lot of people on our team. She's one of them. Yeah, and when she was in the Anglican Church of Canada, she <laughs> stood firm-ish firm -ish. on the gay marriage question. Yeah. You know, not quite all the way in not but definitely not one of the lo looney tunes well the diocese of toronto put out the questionnaire where do you stand on this marriage canon to allow gay marriage and guess who has sold her soul for the next step on the episcopal ladder well victoria matthews she's she, for a she's for gay marriage no. now and she's she used to be against it she's now for so kind of a bill clinton hillary clinton obama type thing going on there now you also remember uh uh jake worley uh he was up he was elected and he was kicked out i understand uh he left the country he left their country he's now in our country okay. uh, <laughs> he's he's south of the border 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 yeah it, it's funny uh well one of my uh father's maxims is you get what you pay for and the Diocese of Toronto is going to get what it's paying for yes, it with, uh, you know, bishops who will basically uh, match the, uh, the, uh, the spirit of the day. Victoria Matthews, uh, you know, will do what it takes to be elected Bishop of Toronto. Jake Worley stood fast, uh, was canned because of his uh, affiliation with the AMIA. He wasn't calling he promised to keep the diocese of caledonia in the anglican church of uh, canada but that was not good enough and he was canned and now we're told that he's living with relatives in-laws in arizona mm. and is unemployed um so you know here it was a travesty of justice what happened to Worley, and you just sort of compare it how the rest see the rest of the canadian church they, they, they can't worry because you are violating one of the eternal principles of the church, which is uh, you once were a member of the AMIA. Whereas other bishops can say they're going to do gay marriage, even though that's against the canons right now. They are still in the process of doing it. Well, those people are elected and applauded. So it's a selective prosecution. It's a selective persecution. And... Well, Kevin, you've got a bishop spot opening in New England. Uh, if Jake yeah. likes the frozen north, you, you know, can't get any it, more frozen than Connecticut. You can't. Uh, bishop Murdoch is retiring, and I know they have a search committee. Uh, if somebody could forward uh, Jack Worley's resume to the search committee uh, for the diocese, I think he'd make a great replacement to Bishop Murdoch. I'm not endorsing it. There's lots of great replacements out there. I'm not putting my my, <laughs> my voice behind one candidate, but uh, certainly would be a good, great choice. George, another great week. Uh, now, you guys are in the throes of summer down there. We're in the throes of fog. It's been a cold spring here in the Northeast. Kevin, move to Florida. What Would can you? I say? <laughs> what can I say? I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 400 of Anglican Unscripted.